Okay, so hello everyone. We are live um, and I'm super excited that Jonathan Blow is today with us. So let's please give him a round of virtual <laughs> applause. Hi, Jonathan, how are you doing? I'm okay. Uh, it's a good day, I think. We'll see how it goes. We can always turn it into a bad day. Oh, that's, that's maybe not a perfect <laughs> start, um, but I'm pretty sure um, it will be a lovely day. I can see the sunshine. So. I can, I yeah, can see the behind. sunshine in there. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's nice. How's the weather in California? It's very warm. It's very warm. Too warm, actually. My room might get a little bit hot during this interview. We'll see. Oh, but it's good. Okay. Yeah. So, so tell us how you're doing right now. How, I mean, it's a weird situation <laughs> right now. Um, how are things in, in the US? How, how are you doing? How you, are you coping um, with this moment, this situation? I just have really a lot of work to do. We're doing a lot of projects and um, consistently throughout the history of my company, right? Um, I'm always like everybody's always waiting for me to get stuff done <laughs> because, you know, I, I sort of, I don't know, it's just the way things work. So, so right now, you know, um, working on two games, uh, neither of which is announced officially and a mm -hmm. programming language, right? That one of the games is written in and like a new game engine for that game. And it's a lot of things. And so when it comes to like, oh, everybody stay home and don't go outside for like, two months, that was fine because I had some really difficult and not fun programming tasks that had piled up for a long time. So for example, um, I actually streamed one of these, um, on one of these games, um, there was a, um, you know, there's a system to the way the characters move. And it was something that I programmed a long time ago when I wasn't sure really how the game was going to need to work. And then now, now that we have a better picture of how the gameplay works and everything that that system needs to do, um, well, it turned out, I mean, it's not really a surprise, but you know, the system that was in place was not robust enough to solve the pro like, like if in a puzzle game, this is a puzzle game, right? In a puzzle game, um, yeah. It needs to operate solidly like a puzzle, right? If you can break the puzzle by running fast or something, it's not a very good puzzle game, right? Or, or if you don't do things exactly right, if it like gets messed up and you end up inside an object, like that's really bad. And um, so I'd rewritten the movement system for this game like five times. And this was the sixth rewrite. And it was finally the good one. Um, and I did that. So, uh, you know, about a month ago. And then I also did a similar thing with the compiler. I like rewrote part of the compiler for two weeks and now it's much mm. better. And it's something that I'd been wanting to do for three years or four years. And so I feel good about these things because um, it's like you're carrying a big heavy rock for four years and then finally you got to put it down. Now there's just a lot of medium sized rocks, you know. No. Oh, wow. Yeah, but uh, I mean, that escalated quickly. So you're working on a game, then you thought, oh, the, it would be nicer to have a better game engine for that. Oh, it would be nicer to write the game engine in a better language. So, so when, when is your operating system coming out? Yeah, maybe soon, not, <laughs> not too soon. Actually, the plan was the other way around. So while working on The Witness, which was the last game that we released, um, in the middle of that, to take a break, I worked on a different game. And um, that game was really fun. I really enjoyed making it and stuff, but um, it, it's, it's not a first person 3D game. It's like a, a top down camera kind of game. And so it would use a moderately different engine than The Witness did. And I said, well, you know, then I started thinking about making a new programming language. And I said, well, if I make a new programming language, I should make this game in that language. But this game is really ambitious, so let's do something that's maybe less ambitious first. And so mm -hmm. the, the, the game that we're making that I just described the puzzle movement system rewrite for is actually the game that we are making so that we can make this other game later. <laughs> so yeah. it's complicated. <laughs> So what is your, like, from your perspective, the most exciting project? Is it the games or is it the... I mean, well, everything is exciting in its own way. 
you know, um, the way that games are exciting changes based on what you're doing and stuff. So, so like the, the puzzle game that I was talking about, um, in the beginning, it was like a cool idea, but most of the excitement came from, we're going to build the engine and all that. And then the game is going to be a thing that we use to test the engine in the programming language, but the I game wasn't that so. f fleshed out. Yeah. And so, so this game, you know, this puzzle game that I mentioned, um, in the beginning, it was a relatively vague idea and you can be excited about a vague idea, but it's mostly about the potential, right? And so mm -hmm. the things that were more concrete at that time was the programming language and making another engine and all that. Um, but then as the game got more developed and became more of a concrete thing, it's easier to get more excited about it specifically because you see what it is and what the possibilities are. Yeah. And if you're making something good, then, then that's, that's going to be exciting. Right? So that game has gotten more exciting. Um, there's another project that we haven't announced at all that was more exciting to me at the beginning. And right now it's, it's less exciting simply because again, I'm the problem on that project. Like I have a bunch of work that I need to do that I haven't done. <laughs> and it's actually, it's not that hard of work, but like, um, it just, other things keep coming up. Um, and so mm -hmm. I'm a little bit not excited about it just because of that normal, like, oh my God, I have to do all these things. Right. But I'm excited about the things and I'm excited about the game, but the, the reality of game development from day to day is that, um, uh, I don't know, like your mood, your mood changes based on what's going on. Mm. That's all. Um, but all the, all the projects are actually exciting overall in the long term. Um, otherwise we wouldn't be doing them. You know, I would, I would cancel something if I thought like, oh, this isn't a good idea anymore, you know? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, speaking of your company and your team, I mean, it's a difficult situation for every one of us right now. Um, how, how did it change or how does it impact your, your company or your team? Uh, is everyone working remote now? Yeah. So we still have an office right now. Um, nobody usually goes in there. It's just got, it's got some servers and stuff that are just running. Um, yeah. And everybody's working from home. Uh, we do occasional video meetings once in a while, um, but nothing too fancy. We don't right now do any of this, like everybody in the same virtual space at once or anything. Um, mm -hmm. What that would look like long-term, I don't know. Like, you know, here in the US, we have no idea uh, what is going to happen with regard to, uh, you know, virus situation. So even if, even if legal, so right now, legally, we're not allowed to have everybody in the office. Right. And even after that changes, is it a good idea? Probably not for a little bit. So we're just, uh, we're just going to keep following the situation and see what makes sense. What, what tools are you using right now with your team? Like in order to communicate, like, is it, Discord, is it Slack or, or some sort of project management, collaboration tools? Well, I mean, we use email a lot. <laughs> um, for the video meetings, I guess we usually use like Google Hangouts or something. Mm -hmm. um, but we can do stuff on Discord sometimes or, um, yeah, I don't know. Probably usually Google though. Mm -hmm. Not not for any specific reason, not because that's better, but just that's <laughs> what we happen to be using. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I mean, we have our usual tools and stuff. So like there's a there's a bug reporting database, for example, that we have. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we don't really use that to assign all the tasks. Like we have a relatively, um, how would I put it? Um, I'm not sure exactly what the project management name for this is, but you know, sometimes if you imagine a project and there's all these things that everybody has to do and mm -hmm. you, you make the little Microsoft project file and you have the timelines and everybody has what they're supposed to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Like mm -hmm. a Gantt chart. Mm, yeah. Like that kind of thing. We don't really do that very much. 
<clears throat> we might do that. Hold on. Sure. <clears throat> I really started, uh, yeah, losing my voice there. Um, we don't really do that uh, very much, you know, not in the long term. Mm -hmm. um, or, or sorry, we do it. We do it vaguely in the long term. We don't do it in the short term. We don't do it like week by week or even month by month. Month usually. So for me, there's just like a lot of stuff that I have to do, and <laughs> there's so much that um, if you were to try to put it on a chart like that, it would just be kind of insane. Um, and so. I just kind of do what I can do when I can do it. <laughs> and sometimes things wait a long time and it's not good, right? But it's yeah. they, they wait because I'm doing other things. And so um, we're not very tightly scheduled like that. And part of that is possible because uh, we're a small team, you know? And so this, like the bigger the team is, the more it a little bit has to behave like an army, you know, where everybody's coordinated and doing something in parallel and, mm -hmm. and all that. Um, we're not quite like that. Um, now this is an interesting thing that I always have to deal with because you have to think, what are you optimizing for? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think if we did do all this project charting stuff all the time, um, people might actually get more work done. <laughs> And, and we might actually do things a little bit faster. However, um, mm -hmm. when you do that, you're in more of a production mode and less of a creative mode, right? And um, with the games that we make, it's, it's always very important to me that we do the best job that we can and that we don't just like rush through something. Like if something is not perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Like you look at it and you're like, I'm, I'm not really sure that this is as good as it should be. I'm not sure if I like where this part of the game is going or what this looks like or the way this gameplay feels, right? Um, mm -hmm. You, a lot, well, a lot of the time people just say, well, that's just what it is and they ship it, right? And what can we do? We're out of time or we don't have any other ideas and they just go, right? But with that kind of thing, those problems really can get fixed if you give them time, um, like calendar time, especially. So if you just say, I'm not going to work on this piece of gameplay that I don't like, and I'll come back to it a month later when other parts of the game are done, when more of the, you know, it's like a Sudoku or something where you're filling out some numbers over here, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then you have a better picture later and you may be able to bring more information to that decision. And if you just said, well, the, the two weeks that I had to solve that problem are gone and now we're on to these other things in the project, then later when you know how to solve the problem, you're not giving yourself the time to actually do that and make the game better, right? And so we're fortunate enough, we, we pay for our own development right now. We don't take money from publishers or anything like that. And so um, we're able to take more time and uh, you kind of have to take more time when you're building a programming language and an engine and a game. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully yeah. after the programming language is done and the engine is done, we won't have to rewrite both of those things completely to do the next games and they should go faster, Absolutely. but who knows? I mean, it's basically an investment into your, the future of your, of, of your development yeah. project. But also though, you know, it's not the kind of thing that you would make as a good business decision if you were trying to run it as a business primarily, right? So for the last game, we just wrote an entire game engine. And so, uh, <clears throat> and that took a long time. It took like, you know, I mean, the whole project took six and a half years for the initial six game, and a half right? Years. Yeah. yeah, it was a really long time. Not all of that was the engine, but a, a lot of it, right? And there certainly were people working on engine features that whole time up until ship. So um, that's a large investment that we're not, like like if you were trying to run a game company as a business, you would say, okay, we're making the witness two now, right? And we're gonna use that engine and we're gonna just have different puzzles. And we're gonna mm -hmm. try to come up with some idea, right? Or even you wouldn't have made the witness, right? You would have made braid two um, way back, you know, in in 2009 2010 and that's just not the way that i ever do things um 
there are consequences to that, but it's still okay. You know, like we don't make as much money as we could if we tried to behave like Zynga or somebody, but we do great. And we have a, you know, we have a good working environment for people and all that. So it's, it's, and so to bring that back, it's like, what are you optimizing for? I'm optimizing for the game being good. That's the number one priority. The game has to be good. Um, hopefully in a way that other people wouldn't make, you know, if we make a game that some other company could make, then maybe that's not the best use of our time. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's nice. yeah. Um, and, you know, attempting to, I'm interested in, in video games as a medium, right. And discovering what they can do and, and pushing forward what people have done. So if we can do that just a little bit, that's good. Um, and then, of course, you can't ignore the business part, right? So we do have to make money. We do have to pay people. Um, but hopefully, if you do a good enough job at the other things, then you'll probably make enough money, maybe, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I mean, you already mentioned that. I mean, time, time management. Is there any schedule for your current games? Is this something you? can talk about or is this there should be more than there is <laughs> you know we we actually should be more disciplined about schedule um mm -hmm. but right now no i mean we have a schedule for one of the projects it's totally unannounced but we keep moving it back because again i mainly mm -hmm. because i haven't done my part yet um So that thing we were we were going to announce it in um, in April, but the whole virus situation caused the event that we were going to announce it with to uh, cancel. So we'll probably announce it within the next couple of months, um, and then I maybe we'll announce a ship date with that. But I I don't exactly know. We'll see. And um, yeah. This, this sounds really exciting. And um, one more question towards time. Um, you, you mentioned it, it took you six and a half years to, to finish um, The Witness. Yeah. Is there anything you would do differently to maybe like um, cut down some of, of this time? Or do you think, no, this was the time I needed to finish this game or? You know, I mean, it's always the case that you can look back and see development mistakes that you made. Like, <clears throat> oh, when I was working on the engine, I spent a month doing this particular thing and we didn't really need it and we took it out, right? And there's there's a few things like that. The, the art, um, concept art process that we did in the beginning was not really the right process and we figured that out later. Um, so I think we could... Like just by fixing process things, we probably could have removed a year from that at least, maybe a year and a half. Um, but I mean, that's sort of cheating, right? Because taking that year and a half is how we figured out the right process things. Um, you could say the same about the game design. Like if I knew exactly what the game was going to be in the end, we could take a bunch of that time yeah. off, right? <laughs> but we were figuring out what the game was. If I knew exactly what the puzzles were going to be, I wouldn't have to design them. I could just type them in and it would be really fast, right? And so, um, I don't know. Um, I, I would like to have made that game faster, but it's also the best game that I've ever worked on. And so, you know, um, it, I, I don't feel it would have been as good if we rushed it. Um, and actually the original, so originally after Braid shipped, I got this idea to do this game and I said, well, maybe we can do it in about, um, 18 months, maybe 24 if we slip the schedule. So two years. Um, but originally the idea was much smaller. It was going to be a much, much smaller game. It was going to be you know, Braid is like four or five hours and this was going to be maybe like a 12 hour game or something. And mm -hmm. the final game that we shipped, depending on, you know, how fast you solve puzzles is like between 45 and 120 hours. <laughs> so um, if you yeah. take the average of that, if you, you know, the middle of that is like 80. 
So oh, yeah. that's like five times as big at least of a game as I had originally been thinking that we would make. And so we didn't take five times as long, quite. Yeah, we didn't take five times as long, so that's good. And um, good, and the graphics were way nicer. And you know, I thought it was gonna be an ugly indie game with like programmer art. And uh, fortunately we had enough budget to hire people and they made the game look really good. So uh, yeah. It all went well. <laughs> so, so how many people um, are working in your team right now? I mean, you, you, I think you hired a bunch of people. I don't know the exact number right now. I should. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to guess 13, um, but I don't actually know without, <laughs> without stopping for a few minutes and counting. <laughs> it's a little bit weird, right? Because, um, you know, right now we have everybody remote. Um, but even before this, um, we had some people who are remote. And so when you don't see everybody every day, it's like, oh, who's doing what? It's just a little bit fuzzier. Are, are you in the office every day or is it um, sometimes in the week or, or do you have some sort of ritual with your, with your um, team? Um, well, during virus time, really almost nobody's going into the office at all. Yeah. Um, before that, no. before that, we had a thing where, you know, people would go in most days, you know, like, uh, maybe, maybe at least four days a week, most weeks, some weeks, three days. And there weren't necessarily very strict core hours. It's just people sort of show up. They could work from home if they want. You know, we don't really, um, we don't track, uh, things like sick days, like how many sick days are you taking or how many vacation days? No, we just, um, we have some simple rules. Like if you want to take off more than two days off for vacation, just let us know a week or two in advance so that we could plan around it, you know? Um, and other than that, people are pretty free to do what they want to do. So it's pretty loose. Um, of course, if you're scheduled to be in a meeting, you probably should be there for it, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very much more casual than a lot of companies and that might only be possible because we're small. I don't know. Like that kind of thing gets harder as a company grows, which I'm not sure if we're going to do, we might stay small. So this is a good size. So between 10 and 20 people, I, I've heard this is a good size for, for a games company. Yeah. It's just hard though, because there's so much work to do. And um, you always can find reasons to have more people, always. Right, right. But uh, also the overhead gets, I think, quite intense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can't just add more people and have them work at full efficiency, right? You start yeah. you start having more coordination costs. You but start having... Someone to coordinate. Um, yeah. You coordinate them. <laughs> well, and then... And then sometimes you can't even tell how well things are going. Like games can be really subtle. So regularly, like any game can be hard to make, right? If you, if you want it to be good. And then if you're doing really weird design stuff like we do, like where, where we're trying to do game designs that other games haven't ever done, mm -hmm. then the quality of what comes out of that really depends on how well does everybody understand what we're doing, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, even with one of these games, it's not just me designing levels for it. There are other people designing levels. And so, um, well, obviously the better they understand the game, the better that comes out. But then when it comes to, uh, making art for the levels, um, I mean, for people who have played the witness, they'll really understand this, but it's true for most games, um, especially puzzle games though, they can get very much easier or very much more difficult or more confusing and frustrating based on just how it looks, how, mm -hmm. what the colors look like and what the patterns are on the screen, because that draws your attention to certain things, right? Like if you're trying to look at a scene and trying to understand what to pay attention to, if there's like distracting stuff that doesn't matter all over the place, it makes it harder and you have to fight the game, you know? And, and so, 
It really helps, for example, when the people doing modeling and texturing understand the game design very well, because then they know what's what's relevant, what, what can be visually emphasized and what shouldn't be. And, and if somebody knows that kind of thing themselves very deeply, they'll do it right the first time or, you know, closer to correct. And, you know, it's hard to do things right the first time, no matter what, but the thing that comes out will be closer to the, the end goal. And you don't have to have this thing that happens on big teams where somebody does something and then you have to have a meeting and say, no, that's not right. And they say, why? And you say, well, because this, and they don't totally, and you do this iteration and then they come back and redo it and it's still not right. And then you redo it and you keep getting closer in the iteration, but you never get that far. Like if people really understand the right thing, they can get further in the first step than that iteration would ever get. Right. I don't know if I'm talking too abstractly at this point, but um, no, no, it's it's this is really really interesting. So, so I yeah. Think Sorry, go. It go ahead. sounds like you have a very like different approach of like of leadership and, and project management, but it, it obviously it works. Um, I, I find this really fascinating. Yeah, I mean it. It so you know with with the witness again, the worry was, can we? make a game that requires a bigger team because making a first person game like that mm -hmm. with all those different locations and writing the engine and all that it just requires people right and the question was can we do an art game like that or is it going to fall apart is this process of production going to force us to make something that's just kind of more of a commercial cookie cutter game are we going to lose the art game specialness and we didn't mm -hmm. i don't think i mean it's it's a different game than Braid, like stylistically, but that's intentional. And so um, I'm very happy with the game that we ended up with. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, and so um, with this game, again, this game's actually easier to do than The Witness in some ways. So we don't we don't have as many problems. Um, but that was the big concern back then. Like the team on The Witness, um, you know, the core team in terms of people who worked for the company was probably about seven or eight most of the time. But when you bring in like all the outside people who we worked with to do like sound and architecture and con contract artists and all these things, um, I think we were up to 22 people at peak. And oh, yeah. managing that without killing the art game part is not that easy, <laughs> you know? And especially growing in the process like from 70 uh, from 7 to 20 or more than 20 yeah during the the development this, this is challenging wow yeah and is there go ahead well good no it wasn't that important what i was gonna say go ahead <laughs> i'm just super curious like if you think of your i mean obviously it works and is there anything you could give as a takeaway to someone who's also um an, a, an indie developer and and would like to create games also through a similar process? Is there some sort of a takeaway you could? You okay, he, here's the thing that's coming to mind, and you can tell me if this is a good answer or if it's too um, too abstract, right? Um, okay, there's this thing that happens right, in, in indie games, right? Indie games, like people have independently made games for a long time, but indie games kind of became its own thing in this 2007 to 2011 time, right? When AAA games got very expensive, but indie games also could get on consoles and Steam and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so indie games became this thing where you, where the people, the reason people want to play your game is for a different reason than for AAA games usually, right? Like. Um, like you have some interesting gameplay that a AAA game wasn't going to do, or you have, um, you have a different visual style or, or something like that, right? There's always like what indie games became was, uh, a, a way of having your game be interesting. That is not, we have the biggest budget, right? So like Assassin's Creed and Call of Duty and all that, the way that they are interesting is just that they spend a huge amount of money building giant, giant games, right? And so indie developers have to do something a little bit different from that. Um, now,
there are different subcategories then, right? So there are people who are doing like art games or games that experiment more with the medium or, or just are trying to do new gameplay, right? And then there's other games that are more like traditional games, but that are independent, right? And for, for the category that I'm in, where we're trying to do something new and different, um, there's a weird problem that people run into, and um, I'm going to characterize it as, and actually this happens on the other side too, but um, <laughs> I'm going to characterize it as uh, either not having high enough standards for your own work or not being self-critical enough, right? And and oh, this, okay, yeah. this doesn't have to be negative, right? It doesn't have to be negatively self-critical. Like sometimes indies get all moody and they say, oh, everything I do is bad or whatever. Uh, I don't mean that. Yeah. But I do mean, um, yeah. you know, like making a game is hard. And so two things can happen. One is you finally make something and you're really excited that you made something, right? And so you have a really positive attitude toward it. Like... You know, it's like if you have a baby, you really like your baby and yeah. you think it's great. Um, you know, but, you know, this is not advice for, for families, right? This is advice for making a game. You have to look at, at the game uh, relatively objectively and see what the problems are because there are going to be a lot of problems, right? Mm. And the, the thing is you can't solve all the problems because games are just really complicated. So you have to pick what's important to solve and what's not important to solve. And so the, the, um, the big mistake that people make, and I'm, I'm finally getting to the point of this answer. Um, the big mistake that people make is when, when they make a game that's about something, mm -hmm. whatever that is, um, they don't notice all the problems that are concerned with what the game is about, right? And they don't optimize for solving those specific problems. Um, and I, I really feel like I should say something concrete here. Okay, so, you know, we, we'll talk about, you know, games that I worked on that people might know. So for Braid, for example, um, it started, it actually started with an idea about doing a quantum mechanics game. It turned into just a, a time rewind game. And then at that point, it was like, okay, this game is about rewinding and doing crazy stuff and having puzzles that are surprising that use time, right? Um, but I didn't then just keep going and make a regular platformer, but with time stuff. I like took out most of the regular platformer things so I could focus on the time stuff, right? And whenever there was a problem, either in implementation or uh, visuals, you know, or anything, I would make the choice in favor of the time part of the game and away from other aspects of the game. So if you try to play Braid like without doing time puzzles, it's a very, very boring platformer. There's hardly any monsters, you know, they, mm -hmm. they don't have very interesting movement, movement patterns, but that's on purpose <laughs> because that helps you understand the other part of the game. Right. And so, so like, I just, I, at some point I decided, yeah, I want to cut away all these other potential parts of the game so that I can focus on this other thing. Right. And with the witness also, like, Interactivity in The Witness is very minimal because I didn't want to introduce anything that would confuse or cause problems relative to the core idea of the game, which I don't want to spoil for anyone who hasn't played it. But um, the art style is, is built around that. Um, everything is built around this core idea that I wanted to make happen as successfully as possible. And so what happens is people say, I want to make a game about a certain thing and they sort of make the game and some parts of it work and some parts don't. And then maybe they make the controls better or something, but it is very, very rare that I look at an independent game and see that it's optimized for its 
uh, for what it's about, for its strong points. Like I usually look at it and say, I can see what you would have done here that would have made this game stronger, you know, and, and for whatever reason, people don't, <laughs> don't do that stuff. I don't know. That was a really long answer. And it's a very, okay, like, this is a very, um, difficult question to answer because at some level it's the very core of what I do. Like this is my job no. in running a studio is to make sure that we do this, but it's still really hard to explain because it, it can get really subtle. But it was a, I, li I really, really, really liked that answer. Thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in writing processes and how to get a better writer, for instance. And one of the core ideas is always that we don't have to put super complicated, super sophisticated sentences with sophistic, full of sophisticated words mm -hmm. into, into the text in order to tell our story. The clearer and the more precise we can um, build sentences, also short sentences, the better of, of a writer we can become often. And, and I, I just this reflected so much um, what you just um, mentioned about game development. That in, in the end, um, if we have one really clear, interesting part of the game, the game mechanic, which you want to convey, and then you break it down to this mechanic and really focus around that, uh, I think I think this this is gold. This is this is really good. Yeah, although I wouldn't even say I wouldn't even say mechanic. Like mechanic is a weird word. No, that, just just, as, just um, as one example. Just the, yeah. the thing which is important to you in within your game. Like, yeah, um, and and I don't know. I don't know how to say more about. I feel like I need to say more about it, but I also don't know what to say. That won't just be a repeat <laughs> of what I just said. It's just it's very important. Like the. You know, so if you want to be a better game designer or producer or something, right? Some job description, um, there's a bunch of skills that you can work on, right? Because games are, are difficult. Many skills come to bear. And some, some of the skills are obvious. Like if you program, you could be a better programmer, right? Like you can, you can get code written faster or the code that you write could run faster or have fewer bugs the first time. So, so these things are all obvious, but there are always skills that are more subtle. And sometimes these are the things that really matter. So um, like, like one thing about programming is um, like implementing the thing that is really best for the design that you're trying to make, right? Like is a skill. And it's a, it's a less obvious skill than these other programming skills. And so a lot of times people just don't even think of that as something to work on, right? Mm -hmm. And so you end up with these problems where people program stuff and it's, it's kind of what it was supposed to do on paper, but not really what the system needs to do to make the game good, right? Or um, I don't know. It's... I feel like I need to think for a while to come up with good examples of this. Um, what about we change the topic for yeah, a while? And sure. Get back there. Um, so I would love, um, I mean, I already mentioned that. So I would love to talk a little bit also about other things, not only game development, mm -hmm. a little bit of maybe about more personal stuff. Uh-oh. So, Scary <laughs> questions. Uh-oh. <laughs> no, I'm always like super excited about like also the people behind, um, I don't know, what is Jonathan Blow doing in the morning or what is, um, <laughs> what is your motivation and your inspiration? Those are those sort of questions. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so well, then, we'll see what start. happens um, with these. I, uh, okay. Um, so Ed is, you mentioned already Sudoku. So there yeah. was this one specific part where you mentioned Sudoku and we yeah. saw a couple of Sudoku tweets. Tell us more about Jonathan's love for Sudoku. I mean, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not really, it's actually not my favorite kind of puzzle, right? Um, and I don't, 
usually do them. Like I, I had a period a few years ago where I did some Sudokus and then I picked them up this past week because I just happened to see a YouTube video where they were doing some interesting ones. And like the one with yeah. the, the, no, the one where you start with the two numbers. So which one? Yeah, like that one. So, so that one, you know, the way YouTube starts suggesting you more things once you see a video. So I saw that video first and then I saw some other things from that same channel about variants of Sudoku with different constraints. And I said, well, it's just interesting as a game designer for me to start playing some of these variants and see how they work because vanilla Sudoku is very, um, I would say it's, it actually starts out interesting when you're learning it. Like when you're starting to learn all the techniques for how to deduce, you know, how to make progress, right? Um, mm -hmm. But then at some point, it becomes more just like a routine exercise where you're not you're not gaining more understanding anymore usually, or or maybe just at a very very slow rate, and you're just doing this puzzle solving activity, which is totally fine. Like there's nothing wrong with that, but I I like puzzles where you understand something new after you've done the puzzle, right? And and so video games do that a lot. And so I like puzzle video games maybe more than pen and paper video games generally. Um, but so then when it when it came to these you know modified Sudoku formats, I was like, okay, let me just play some of these and have fun and have that initial period of learning that comes from doing the new thing. Um, and then I'll just, it's also uh, extended education of myself as a game designer, right? Mm -hmm. So so I've been doing that some for the past few days. So, so it's research. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, so so I like just just reflecting like Sudoku's like I, I would get up every morning and then solve one Sudoku. Um, I'm super excited to learn about morning rituals in general. Do you have specific morning um, rituals? How does your morning look like? No, not not very much. Um, I it depends on how hard I'm working, right? If I'm if I'm on a streak of like working on stuff where I'm really motivated and stuff, I'll just get up and start programming like first thing because. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go do a social media thing or check email or something, it's a great way to not get anything done. And so mm -hmm. if you're if you're motivated, um, it's actually very easy to do a bunch of stuff first thing in the morning. And then that's great because it almost feels like extra because then you can go have breakfast or whatever. And then whatever else you do that day, you have this extra two hours or 90 minutes or something of work added onto that. Um, other days... I don't know. I mean, it's it's of course a little bit different now that we're in California quarantine, where I just I just took a trip out of California because I don't think the way California is handling things is very good, um, and so then my my daily thing was totally different because I was in a different place. Yeah. Um, Tell us about our, about the trip. What did you do? Where did you go? <laughs> um, I went to Las Vegas uh, because it was one of the places that I heard was sort of more opening. Mm -hmm. um, and that was interesting. So I'm not a gambling person. That's not why I went to Las Vegas. But I just thought it would be interesting to go and um, uh, be a little bit more of a free person mm -hmm. and just to see what was going on. So I did that. Um, and I read a book and did some programming but then my laptop broke so i couldn't do too much programming oh. <laughs> you know it was it was a good six days though oh I, six days that's yeah yeah that's good yeah. yeah um yeah um um what i mean what would you do in your like free time in your spare time so uh, reading book is that something you mentioned um sometimes you know, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I go dancing a lot, or I used to before before the year 2020. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a good, it's a good thing because, um, I mean, it's exercise, right? It, it gets the body moving as opposed to just sitting in a chair like this all the time. But also, um, for the mind, it's very different. And... Um, 
there's a way that doing, I mean, I don't know about various kinds of sports and stuff, but for dancing, there's a way that when you've done it a lot, you get into a mode where you are making decisions about what to do, but they're pretty automatic and you're not really thinking about it at all. Mm -hmm. And so your mind is kind of just resting or the, the, the normal, you know, thinking maneuvering part of your mind is resting and you're just in this different mode. Mm -hmm. And after doing that, you know, it's like uh, meditation or something like that, where something about that kind of rest helps integrate ideas through the mind or helps things that have been buried to like bubble up. So I've had times when I've been dancing and then right in the middle of it, an idea for a really good puzzle pops up or, you know, whatever I'm doing or a solution to some programming problem. And then I go write it down really fast and then go, go back. Um, I don't know. So, so I think it's, it's been an important way for me to stay sane while spending a lot of time programming, you know. How often do you go dancing? Well, I used to go uh, maybe between two and four days a week, like a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but, but now uh, I haven't gone for many months. Um, yeah. It's an interesting thing, though, too. So... When it comes to just programming, right? My style of programming is very different than it used to be. And it's also, it's a lot less logical. Like people think of programming as like logical problem solving. And that's how it is in the beginning. Um, because you have to think like, okay, I do this and then this and then this and put this over here. Um, but once you've done it a lot, it's like driving a car where you don't really have to think about driving it you just go where you're going and um i mean program it, for the programming that takes a lot longer because programming is very complicated but it also becomes kind of a subconscious activity a lot of the time so you can just you can just like do stuff you can just like program without thinking about it that much and uh i think that also keeps me sane like i think if you're like trying to logically solve problems all the time um it's very tiring <laughs> mm. yeah uh, but but things like dancing sports um i mean i mean i have this when running or mountain biking like after 20 minutes or 30 minutes or so um it's i think it's in, when you run it's called the runner's high or something like that mm -hmm. sure you all of a sudden get into this this entirely different mode you mentioned meditating Do yeah uh, probably not as much as I really should. Um, I have some education in a couple of different meditation traditions, though, and they're different. You know, one of them is a very um, strict sitting meditation, and I don't actually do that very often. But another one of them is not like that, and you can actually do while you're just walking down the street or you can do while you're being interviewed by somebody over the internet. And so um, that one I do more often, I would say. Um, maybe so not for long stretches, but. How does it work? Uh, do you? Uh, you know, I, I maybe, I couldn't do justice to it right now um yeah. i would say uh, okay let me let me try to let me try to give some answer so they don't totally dodge <laughs> um okay so there's a very it's a very simple meditation honestly um mm -hmm. so like if i'm if i'm if i'm talking to you we're hanging out and i say hey um don't Don't answer me from memory. Just honestly check the answer to this question and then tell me. Um, are you a conscious being or not? Like, do you, do you have conscious awareness or not, right? And then you check if you do. And then you tell me the answer, which, I don't know, what's the answer? What would you say? Maybe sometimes. I don't know. Maybe sometimes. <laughs> Maybe sometimes. 
Do you have, I mean, so sometimes, sometimes people make a big deal out of this, but like, if you, if you have an actual experience right now, right? Yeah. Then the answer is probably yes. Yeah. Um, but so, so the, the point of that though is, and this is something everybody can do at home. Um, the point of that is there's a thing that you do to actually check, right? You maybe get quiet for a second and, and, and look and say like, what? Mm -hmm. And it puts you into a certain mode of regarding your own experience. And you can actually go very deeply into that mode, right? But the, that, that exercise of being asked that question and answering it for yourself is just a very simple way of showing you where that is, oh, right? And then you, then you can go very deeply into that and say, what are the... Um, what are the properties of conscious experience, right? And like what, not, not necessarily logically thinking about it. You could logically think about it later <laughs> when you want to, you know, talk to somebody about it or something, but just, just to observe, right? And um, that's a very useful thing to do, we'll say. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. I've I mean, I, I try to meditate every day, but in a very different way. So probably this, this annoying thing where, thing where you try to sit and, and then try to don't think about anything <laughs> and try. Yeah. Um, but that's really difficult, but very useful. Um, so I, I don't know, for me, it absolutely helps me to stay concentrated for the rest of the day and, and be a little bit more calm. So what, what does it give? you or what, what benefits do you see when you're doing that? I would, I mean, okay. I, I certainly in life have gotten many benefits out of it, right? I would say that I definitely, you know, when I meditate more, I have a much improved mood. Um, mm -hmm. I'm better at solving problems. I'm better at like dealing with other human beings. Um, so I obviously should do it more than I do, <laughs> right? Um, but I always find reasons not to, um, at the same time though, it's not the reason I do it. Um, mm -hmm. like, like benefits in everyday life are nice, but they're not what is that important to me, right? Like what's important to me is understanding the universe that we live in and meditation is one thing that can help with that uh, in a very serious way and so that would be why why i do it and that's kind of more of a long-term mission statement <laughs> right because at any given time it could be hard to say what progress you made on that long-term mission statement, right? But at the same time, I've had um, I've had big personal surprises, like especially this kind of meditation I mentioned, where you notice things about your conscious experience. It's very powerful, um, and there are little variant exercises that you can do that end up being very powerful. And I've had like, you know lifelong changes to my personality that happened in one second from observing something and saying like, oh, wow, okay, that's that. All right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's you know, yeah. um, but, but, you know, I, if I go meditate, I don't do it in order to expect such a thing because, mm -hmm. I mean, A, that's a, a great way to ruin your ability to actually meditate, but B, um, if you know what to expect, uh, you're probably limiting your possibilities to something a lot less interesting than, than what could potentially happen. Right. There are some questions, um, in the, in the chat about that. If you have any okay. like re reading tips about that, um, or is there any other about meditation questions? stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily recommend trying to learn from reading because it's just very easy to interpret the words in a book the wrong way and to start doing things that are totally wrong. 
<laughs> so I would recommend doing real life instruction. Um, that's probably hard in many parts of the world right now, but yeah. you know, maybe just videos or something. It's just a better form of communication for this. Mm. Well, that's, 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 that's wonderful. Okay. Um, when I look um, at your background, there are many things which are super interesting. And obviously one of them is the, the art. <laughs> well, what are the pictures we see in your? In well, the um, I mean, I could have much more interesting stuff. Um, so this one, wait, wait, it's hard for me to point because it's opposite. Yeah. Um, that's actually one of the posters that we made for the witness relatively, maybe toward the middle of development starting to be toward the end when we hadn't mm -hmm. you know decided on everything um this thing over here is uh um it's a painting uh by a guy named mick turner who's from australia and he is in a band that was one of my favorite bands. i mean they're still one of my favorite bands they don't really tour anymore uh called the dirty three and uh I was like, hey, I could support the band and get a nice painting by getting this. So I, I bought a few a few of his prints and that's what that is. Is art something which is um, interesting, important to you? Um, yes, but I don't do as much of it as maybe I should. But there are times when I go to art museums if it's a really, if it's a museum that has things that I really connect with, um, I could spend a really long time there. So once a few years ago, um, I went to Washington DC where we have the, the National Gallery of Art is one. There are, there are a number of large museums in, in Washington DC. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is the National Gallery of Art. I, I had planned to also go to the Smithsonian and a few other places. But I just didn't, I just went back to the National Gallery of Art like two days in a row because I just spent all this time looking at a small selection of things because you really can absorb a lot about something. Um, you know, it always bothers me a little bit, maybe not because I, I do this with some styles of art, but you know when people go to a museum and they just look at a painting for two seconds and then go and look at a painting for two seconds, if you do that with everything in the museum, you probably shouldn't be in that museum because you're not getting much out of it, right? Or maybe you're just getting something very surface. Maybe it's fine. Uh, but um, I mean, how long, if it's a painting, like an oil painting, how long did it take that artist to make that oil painting? You know? Yeah. Sometimes quite a long time. And why did they spend that long? And what did they hope for you to get out of it if they spent that long making it, you know? Mm -hmm. And just starting to, starting to build a receptivity to those aesthetics is, can be a useful thing. I don't know, that's yeah. it very vague statement, but, but yeah, but I also, you know, I try to do that when I travel, but it's very hit and miss, you know, sometimes I go to, to a museum or a gallery and I'm like, yeah, this isn't doing it for me like at all. That's mm -hmm. especially true with modern art. I don't like modern art exhibits almost ever, um, or not. I mean, sometimes you see some things and it's like, it's fine, but it's just not that deep usually. Hmm. Where, I mean, since we're talking about like art uh, and going to museums and places, where would you draw your inspiration from typically? I mean, you already mentioned um, during dancing sometimes, but, but more about this, hmm, when you want to get inspired, do you have places where you would um, go to? You know, I, I'm trying to think of all the random times when I've had inspirations and they don't always turn into something. So like I'm thinking of a, a time when I was at a museum in Barcelona and there was a sculpture that I saw that like, I was like, oh, this is perfect uh, for this 
it just gave me some ideas of something to put in a game. We're not actually working on that game right now. So like it hasn't, um, but it was definitely an interesting inspiration that I had. Um, it just comes by surprise a lot of the time, right? Mm -hmm. the, the real inspirations you can't plan or I, I don't know how to plan. Maybe you can plan them. I don't know how. Um, <laughs> Because because it's like a puzzle piece fitting into place or something, and you didn't have that puzzle piece before, mm. and now you get it, and you're like, oh, the shape of this is like exactly this thing. Um, except maybe you didn't even know the shape that you were trying to fit it into because it was like deep down in your subconscious mind. So um, I don't know. I just try to expose myself to things <laughs> potential and sometimes it is very inspiring that said i also just have a lot of work to do in terms of programming and design and all these things and so um maybe maybe i'm not doing the optimal uh proportion in each department i don't know hmm. well, interesting yeah and so I think it's on your right shoulder. We see a bunch of books. A bunch of books back here. So can we can we talk now for some hours about books? <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, 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 I'm always super excited about books and I would just really love to. What are you reading at the moment? What am I reading at the moment? So I'm most of the way through this book uh, right here called Hacker's Delight, which is a programming uh, programming book. Uh, wow. About wow, the focus doesn't like that. There we go. Um, it's about uh, a very specific kind of algorithm, mostly having to do with uh, operations on integers stored in twos complement notation or twos complement representation, which is the way that basically all modern computers store numbers and uh, you know, it turns out there's a lot that you can do. And a lot of the things in the book are things that, you know, people who work on game engines were probably aware of to some degree, but when you put it all together, it makes this really high density, interesting mm -hmm. study. And so that's been nice. Um, what else have I been reading recently? Um, there are definitely a few things like sometimes I pick things up and, you know, I kind of try to read them and I don't. Um, and you put them onto a pile and look at yeah. them. <laughs> so, so I started reading again, like last year, I started reading again through Stephen Wolfram's book, A New Kind of Science that he self-published mm -hmm. like back in 2000 or something. And that is actually really pretty good. I mean, you have to, you have to filter out about a quarter of it because it's it's too verbose and has the wrong priority sometimes in terms of what it's talking about. Uh, it's also very large. So I was carrying, <laughs> I could go into the next room and get it, but I won't. I was carrying this very big, heavy book around all the time. Um, and that was good. Uh, and then, then though he made his physics project announcement this year, which is like, like a little bit more modern along that same line of thinking. And so, you know, I started paying attention to that. Um, fiction wise, um, somebody gave me the book, uh, The City in the City by China Mieville late last year. I read that. Um, mm -hmm. I've been reading a few books by Olaf Stapledon, who's a science fiction writer. And the most, uh, I read I read First and Last Men last year when I was traveling through Asia. And then I started reading um, Last Man in London, which is sort of a, a sequel to that, but I, for some reason, just wasn't making progress in that. And so that's laying around here somewhere. Um, there's some other fiction books that I've read more recently than that. And I'm trying to remember, oh, um, Ted Chang's book of short stories. Um, he has an, a new collection that came out. I had already read, I think, actually everything that's in that collection, but it was an opportunity to reread some hmm. of them. Um, so mainly science fiction? 
that's what I've been doing lately. Yeah. Um, I mean, the city in the city is sort of science fiction-y, but not really. Oh, I read, um, what is this book called? Uh, there's a book called Squaring the Circle. I forget the author's name that I just heard of randomly on the internet. It's a very small, short book. This might be the most recent fiction that I read. Um, that's not even true, but um, it's it's a interesting book. It's kind of like Invisible Cities by Calvino, which is one of my favorite books historically. Um, but it's it was written roughly contemporaneously with that. And it wasn't really ever finished. And so, um, you know, somebody took sort of scraps from it or, or the, the, the most finished parts or the best parts and put it together into as close to a complete thing as possible. And so I read that and, and that was pretty interesting. Um, I don't know, is that a good enough survey? <laughs> or like, I feel like I'm leaving more. a lot out, but. More. More. Uh, what what, what, what nonfiction books were in, important for you? I, I lately or generally. Generally, maybe we can move also more to the like general section. I mean, so, new new kind of science was was pretty, uh, not well. It's definitely nonfiction, and it was it was very interesting, right? Um, I don't know. I mean, if I look back at the bookshelf here, I could pick out a lot of things. Actually, let me let me pick out. There's a book sticking out that'll be interesting, right? Let me grab it. We're not leaving you. We're waiting here for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I just this caught my eye back on the shelf. So um, this book I knew about because it was just trendy to know about this around the Game Developers Conference in like 1999 or whatever, but this is Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. This is one of my favorite books. Yeah. It's so useful. So, um, you know, it's, basically, it's, it's a comic book, right? Um, that the goal of which is to explain comics as an art form and how they work. And uh, that is very interesting. First of all, just to know these things about comic books is interesting by itself. But then if you're interested in designing video games and working on the field of video games as an art form, then this is very informative by analogy, right? Because you can read this and see these th specific things about comic books that sometimes are, are things that you wouldn't have thought of by yourself. Um, and then say, okay, what are those things for games? And have we discovered all of them? And the answer is no, we haven't discovered all of them. Um, and it just, it, it helps you give something more specific to extrapolate from. Let me, I, actually, I think I can probably find something else. Hold on.
Okay, you know, I was going to look for one book and then I grabbed a few more. Yay. Um, <laughs> okay. So, so what's the, 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 the book that I wanted to grab was another uh, comic book or graphic novel, right? Yeah. So um, this one's called Logic Comics. Um, uh-huh. It is a nonfiction graphic novel about mathematics and what makes mathematics interesting. It follows the life of Bertrand Russell. Uh, so it's it's kind of a biography of Bertrand Russell in comic book form, but it's also uh, about mathematics. Um, so so that's and it's you know a, yeah, and a lot of the time um, when you get a graphic novel like this, like usually. When they're about weird topics like non-mainstream graphic novels, usually some dimension of the graphic novel is kind of lacking, you know, because like either the writing isn't good or the the visuals aren't good. So why is it a graphic novel? Like I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but um, you know, but here it's like no, this is all it's all good. It's like a high quality, high quality thing um, that's very interesting to read. So. That's, okay. you now have two comic book recommendations. Um, we'll leave this one for later. Uh, so um, there's Gravity's Rainbow, which is my, probably my favorite long form novel, um, mm-hmm. which I've read several times and has been very uh, inspiring to me uh, by, by Thomas Pynchon in case anybody, mm-hmm. I don't know, there's a little bit of glare on that. Um, it's probably not obvious in what way this <laughs> this book is influential on stuff that I've done, um, but it has been. So I didn't see Invisible Cities. I'm sure I have a copy around here. Let me find it. Hold on. Blah, blah, blah. Seems like we're getting a lot of recommendations. That's great. Okay, I am not, for some reason, able to find Calvino's book, Invisible Cities, even though I have like yeah. three copies of it, which is one but of the thought. inspirations mm-hmm. for Braid. Okay. Uh, but I dug this one out, which is uh, Cosmic Comics, and there's a sequel to this called T-Zero, which is also like one of the inspirations for Braid and the way that I think about game design. It's a very, um, like the way this book works is there's a bunch of little short chapters, like... Games without, uh, yeah. And they're, they're each like a few pages, or uh, sometimes they're mm-hmm. a little longer, right? It's, it's a collection of short stories, um, but they're all... Uh, I would describe them as like magical realist science fiction. So they happen with, you know, characters in space or whatever, and with very uh, fanciful conceits. So there's one, for example, where somebody is just really like lives for the age of the galaxy and they're just like rotating around. They're just like somewhere out in the galaxy and rotating around, right? And trying to leave notes for like anyone else who's, I don't know, it's hard to explain. Um, but it's it's kind of, it, it's this idea of let's stop and uh, come up with some idea for how the universe might work and it's weird and fanciful and like not straightforward. And then let's see what that turns into as a story, right? Um, so similarly, so Invisible Cities, which I can't find is, is by the same author. And then uh, this book, Einstein's Dreams by Alan Lightman was the other thing I read uh, that's in that same format uh, before making Braid. So again, it's, um, it's 
the, the form of this is it's a bunch of diary entries written by Albert Einstein, fictionally, right? As, uh, as he's thinking about different ways that the universe could be. And each piece is just a few pages. Um, okay, weird stuff. I, I grabbed this. This isn't really a super inspiration or anything, but I grabbed it because it would be weird and funny to show. This is something that I saw on college. Um, it is a book where the author Tom Phillips took a Victorian novel uh, called A Human Document that was just like, it's like a soap opera kind of book, like written a long time ago, and mm -hmm. made poetry by giving himself some constraints and then coloring over or sketching over all the pages so of, of the original book. So you open it and it's like, you know, wow. he painted over everything except for some words, you know, How and then... And you read those words and it makes a poem and then the, the paint over makes a picture. And, um, you know, like he just goes through a wide variety of like doing different styles of thing. That's interesting. Wow. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you get the idea. It's, it's a lot of, it's actually impressive how much stuff there is in it. This um, is impressive. Yeah. It's a lot of paper. It's a lot of content. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, 300 pages. <laughs> um, okay, these, here's another author that uh, I would say is more of a direct inspiration. Um, so Calvino, I was introduced to Calvino in college in my first year. One of the reasons why I'm glad I went to college. Um, and then I started looking around for other authors that scratch that same itch at the same time. And uh, there's this guy, uh, Milorad Pavic, who I, I believe he's Serbian. Um, Sounds Serbian, I guess, yeah. And he writes books that have, again, different like format constraints. So this one, for example, um, is called Dictionary of the Khazars, and it's sort of a history of, uh, of a forgotten people, which is mostly fancifully made up, um, but it's in the form of a dictionary. So if you go to the table of contents, um, a lexicon novel. <laughs> like there's, there's some introductions, but then uh, I guess there isn't a table of contents. It's just an alphabetical order. But so it starts, it starts with A and then it goes, it goes to Z, but then it does it three times because there are like three different sources for information uh, that are based on different you know, followers of different religions who reported things in different ways. So it's like seeing the same scenario through different conflicting lenses and through different styles. And you're supposed to potentially read it non-linearly. So you're reading and you're like, oh, who's this person? And then you go to the section on that person and start reading that. So it, it's sort of like hypertext, but this was written like before the web and all that. Um, so that was cool. Um, here's another book of his called Landscape Painted with Tea, which is more like a crossword puzzle in format. Um, where, uh, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to, it's hard to explain why, because it, if I open the book, it mostly looks like text, but um, it's like these different, these different lines of, uh, of story like intersect with each other the way that words would intersect in a crossword puzzle <laughs> so cool that's enough books probably yeah. I, but, but I could is, go for a long time this is a high thing so um there's a lot lot of books which are not like the conventional books I, yeah. I, I was just thinking about the book which, which is called the house of leaves by yes danielevsky um, yeah, I did read that, but um, I read that actually after Braid came out. Someone recommended that book and I read it and I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> I, I, really, I really liked this one um, also because it was not this traditional book or another book you would expect. 
And I was really sort of immersed in, into the story through that. Yeah, I had an experience where I, I liked the book, but I also wanted him to do things that he didn't do. And then I got frustrated with it. Like in, the, <laughs> in that book, there's, there's sort of, you know, kind of as a joke, I guess, there are all these like really long footnotes. And some of them are just like list of things. Like this isn't literally one of them, but it's like, Here's what this person got from the grocery store on March 7th, you know, eggs, bread, <laughs> tortillas, ketchup. And it goes on for like seven pages, right? I remember um, that, yeah. <laughs> and what I wanted the book to do is start to, because the book is kind of fictionally about this confusing maze-like underground play. I don't want to spoil anything, right? But, um, and I wanted it to be like, where I started reading a footnote and then that footnote sort of turned into the main story, right? Somehow. And like where the, the progression of, of what the main line of thought was like, wasn't obvious and were things like, I wanted more like structural, uh, play. <laughs> than I got. I mean, it was still a good book, but but sometimes when that happens, when I'm like, I wish I wish this book had done blah blah blah, um, the experience is different. <laughs> I get frustrated. Um, it was I, I like the horror um, environment, um, and, and then he made a sort of horror book out of it. Yeah, yeah. A bit to that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing so many books with us um this this is very very interesting and uh, um also it's interesting to see that there are all sort of hmm, unique well there are probably a bunch of books back here that wouldn't be very unique as well i just grabbed i grabbed some of the more interesting ones but also some of the ones that are that you could say were an actual influence on the way that i do things right yeah, yeah. Is there um, any like must reads? Like, could be those super known books which everyone sort of has to read at some point, which you would also underline? Must read. That's a very strong, a must read is a strong recommendation. You should very, like, you're really <laughs> <laughs> um, supported when reading that, or you <laughs> I strongly suggest reading that books. I honestly don't know because the things. The things that were most meaningful to me might not be that interesting to other people, right? So like like I said, Gravity's Rainbow. Yeah. Very meaningful to me in ways that are hard to explain. Um, but I don't necessarily know that somebody else would get any of... In fact, if there's anything that I've learned, it's that very often people don't get what I get out of these things, you know? Um, so it, it, it's hard to make it a recommendation for that reason because, yeah. you know, yeah. Any nonfiction books, maybe? I'm having a hard time. I mean, must read is a really high bar. It's a really high bar. Trying to reformulate. Nice to read. <laughs> <laughs> nice to read. Well, a lot of things are nice to read. <laughs> um hmm. or also if you think of your like books at college anything which hmm, was useful from college mm. see the thing is no <laughs> i mean there are some various computer books but they're um They're fine. They're not great. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Okay, then then let's move move on from books okay. To, okay. to movies and documentaries. Movies and documentaries. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm not not using the word like must see, <laughs> must watch. No, but but what um do you, do you watch a lot of movies, documentaries? What's your take on that? Um, if so, what do you like? 
I go through phases of watching a lot of movies and then not watching any movies because I get frustrated at how bad a lot of movies are. Um, I would say, so, so things that I've seen recently, it's again, it's going to be hard for me to remember the things that I've seen that were like really good. Um, so the documentary that's coming to mind is the Apollo 11 documentary, which came out last year, um, which is, uh, very good. It's probably my favorite documentary that I've ever seen. It follows the moon landing from beginning to end, um, in, in a kind of accelerated real time, right? made out of all this footage, but, uh, by, by watching it, you come to understand this thing at a level of detail or at a level of appreciation that you wouldn't otherwise, if you just heard like, Oh, the moon landing happened on this date and these people were involved, right? Like if you read a history book, you wouldn't get a very good understanding of it. Um, seeing it was, was very interesting. And, and, um, this dovetails with some things that it's very easy for me to get very serious about, uh, which is that um, I'm not such a big fan of uh, what modern civilization has been doing for like, I don't know, let's say since 1975 or something. Um, like all of the first world countries seem to have sort of been... Um, living off the situation that was created beforehand and like not really working that hard and not making fundamental progress that we need to make on things that are important. And of course, I mean, you know, technology has advanced since that time, like certainly, um, but maybe not at the same pace that it did before that time. Um, and certainly not nowadays when, for example, most of the stuff that happens in the US that we consider technology advancement is software. And most of that software is not actually technological advancement. It's just like people making a different app. Like the, the technological advancement that actually happened is this amazing um, progress in the ability to make better integrated circuits, right? That companies like Intel and AMD design and like TSMC fabricates and, and like, what, all these things, right? Um, but then software makes all this money because they figure out ways to use those chips to address markets that haven't been addressed, right? But they're not actually, like the, the quality of the software is terrible. It usually doesn't work very well. Um, it's not programmed very well. It will fall apart if a large number of people don't maintain it. So it is not a suitable infrastructure for future society. We're gonna have to rebuild the entire internet if we want it to actually work, right? Um, but, uh, it's instructive to see the difference between that and like what people did, right? So the, the Apollo program, um, there was a famous Kennedy speech where he said, we're going to land on the moon before the decade is over, which I forget if it was seven years or eight years from then, it was not a long time. Mm -hmm. Nobody, you know, nobody had really even seriously thought about landing on the moon. And there, yeah. there was not much rocketry in the United States at all, right, at that point. And they went from not being really competent in rocketry to landing on the moon. And to see the scale of what was done in that documentary is very informative. And then you start to ask, could, could we even do that today, right, if we wanted to? Um, I don't think we could, right? We, we couldn't do it in, you know, from scratch in seven or eight years. I, yeah. And what happened, right? Like, why is construction, I don't know how it is in Austria, but in the United States, even just building anything, like a building or a road or putting up a new pipe under the road, like, it takes years. <laughs> You know, yeah, and it's very expensive. And why, right? What what did we do? Like, you know, I just went to Las Vegas. One of the things that's near Las Vegas that video game people might know about is the Hoover Dam, because that's in several civilization games and whatever as a wonder of the world. Um, it's a very very impressive engineering project. It was done in the 1930s, right? Um, the Bay Bridge that goes between San Francisco, where I live, and and Oakland. Um, 
made originally in the 1930s. We've replaced part of it because it extended past its lifespan. The rest of it, we haven't even replaced. Mm -hmm. The part that we did replace took a lot longer than the entire original bridge took to build. And we have materials and, and material science and, and you know tooling and all these things that are 70 to 80 to 90 years in advance of what they had back then. So why do we do such a worse job? And um, there are some obvious answers, like we care more about safety now, but does that, does that make you 10 times worse at doing something? It shouldn't. Um, so I think these are questions that we haven't answered as a society, and mm. I'm very interested in that. And so Apollo 11 is sort of one of the things that kicked my interest in that up to a higher degree, because when you really see it, it's like, oh, yeah. We really did a lot of bigger things back then, you know. Some of them were very scary, right? So we had the Manhattan Project during World War II, which again, in a short amount of time, brought together a lot of expert people to do something that at the start of the project, hardly anybody thought was possible. In a short period of time, doing something really big and really scary, right? Um, all these highways that we have in the United States were built I think in the 1950s. So we still were able to do big stuff in the 1950s. And then after that, not so much. So um, it's a thing to think about what happened there. Okay, you, but back on the topic of movies and stuff, I guess. Did you, did you watch the launch or not launch yesterday? I did. Um, so I will be watching the next launch or not launch based on, on Saturday, what happens. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now it's interesting, right? I don't remember what the odds were for the space shuttle, but um, I believe the number that I saw was odds are one in 246 of catastrophic mission failure. In other words, the astronauts probably die. Uh, with, with I don't mean probably die. I mean, there's a one in one, there's a one in 246 chance of the astronauts getting killed, right? Roughly. Um, which is, on the one hand, not that bad for, for launching something new into space. Um, but on the other hand, those are risks that would not be considered acceptable most places, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it brings up this interesting question of how much risk are you willing to accept and how much does that control what you're able to accomplish? And these are things that we used to grapple with routinely as a society, and we don't anymore. Like, we like to pretend that those risks don't exist, usually. Um, it's very weird, right? right? So, for example, with this virus situation, right? We're treating it very, very, very seriously, as we should, because, well, I mean, we, we should do different things than, than we have been doing, but, but it should be taken seriously because the upside or the the... If you handle it maximally badly, the penalty is very, very large, right? Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, people drive cars around all the time. And it's not just the people driving the cars that are victims of accidents, right? Other people get killed and stuff. And those numbers are quite large and we still do it and don't worry about it, right? And so we're inconsistent in our treatment of these risks, right? Uh, like we're willing to shut down the entire economy for an infectious disease, but not for driving, even though, I mean, you wouldn't even have to shut down the whole economy to stop all these driving fatalities, you just make driving illegal, right? Um, but, but we'll do one and not the other, and, and why? It's a little bit weird. And we just haven't, um, we just haven't uh, integrated our decision making together, I would say. Movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, hmm. Let's 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 go back to the movies. That's yeah. Um, um well, I don't know. Um um do you watch Netflix? Is is there like uh, do you have this binge watching behavior? Like 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 watching some shows for instance? You know, I do that sometimes. 
And I basically always regret it. <laughs> you know, I mean, well, there's this interesting thing that happened. So I gave a speech one time a few years ago about how television got more interesting, part of it, because I then applied it to games. But part of it was about television. Um, you know, I grew up watching really bad TV shows in the 1970s and 80s when I was very young. And these shows had a very strict uh, format where, mm -hmm. you know, they had some main characters and maybe some main bad guys, maybe not. Maybe it was bad guy of the week. And whatever happened in the show, nothing that serious could actually happen because you can't change the state of the show because they're made to be watched in random order. You didn't have to follow along. So like if you watch, you know, Knight Rider, which was this goofy show about a, a 1980s <laughs> sports car robot David that a guy Hasselhoff. drives around. Yes, David Hasselhoff. Um, yeah, the Germans and the Austrians love David Hasselhoff. Here. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. <laughs> so he pretty um, much teared down the wall in Germany. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the format of that show is this guy is the hero and he drives the car around and catches bad guys every week. So the hero can't get killed, right? Or his friends can't get killed or whatever, unless it's like season seven and the actor is quitting and then you need to write him out of the show, right? But for the most part, nothing actually serious happens. So you can't have consequences on those shows, right? Yep. And so, so then once you had maybe some of these earlier long form shows like The Sopranos or uh, you know, Deadwood. I actually like Deadwood. I never watched Sopranos, but Deadwood was really good, actually. It's a recommendation for people to watch. Um, they didn't have that format because they were made to be watched in series, right? And then they could actually have a story where things actually happen and characters change over time, right? And serious things happen to them, good things or bad things or whatever. Usually bad things because these shows are dramatic, right? Which is actually something, like I can't watch Black Mirror at all because it's like pointlessly negative in a way that's actually not meaningful. It's weird. Um, anyway, uh, so that changed and at the time when I gave the speech, I was like, oh, this is completely a good change, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it makes the shows better. It has the potential to make the shows a lot better. But the problem that we have now is the format is there's a show. It's got like, I don't know, 20, 22 episode seasons. We want it to get three or four seasons out of it and we want people to binge watch it. So it's become the opposite thing where storytelling is about filling 22 hours of time to get to the end of the season. And so let's just make up a bunch of stuff that happens that mostly doesn't matter, but that will string people along through the episodes. So like something really dramatic will happen at the end of episode two that we've forgotten about by episode four or five. And in fact, if you zoom out and look at the whole season after it's done, like that thing didn't even make any sense given what they claim is like happening in this world. So all these shows are very, they're very incoherent and they're very, I think, disrespectful in the same way that like, um, you know, like a phone game that's trying to get you to buy microtransactions is very disrespectful. These shows yeah. are just trying to get you to watch them. And they're not actually trying to tell a story in the traditional way. Like almost none of what I love about Gravity's Rainbow is in these shows, hmm. you know? Um, and in fact, they're a lot like modern movies in that they don't, they don't really make sense at all, except minute to, like they try to make an excuse minute by minute about what's happening. Like why did this character do this? Well, it's because of that. And like, they show the character doing the thing, but if you step back and actually think about what, not only that character, but what anybody would do in that situation, they wouldn't have done the thing in the show. But they did that decision in the show so that they could get to this next scene that they want to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And then once you see that in these shows, you can't unsee it and they're just all really bad. So um, I honestly can't recommend almost anything um, show-wise or movie-wise because they're all written that way now and um, uh, it's a problem. In fact, so one of my favorite things to watch is if you go on YouTube, um, you, there's this show uh, done by a guy named Ryan George called Pitch Meeting, where 
he pretends to be a Hollywood producer and a script writer. He plays both characters, like pitching, pitching the idea for a movie to the Hollywood producer. And he's basically making fun of movies and, and how bad these aspects of the movies are. And it's a very funny YouTube show. So I recommend that and not, you know, binge watching <laughs> some bad sci-fi show or something. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the, the thing about consequences, I can remember, for, for instance, at The Simpsons, there yeah. was back then, like, there were every show, there were never any consequences. And I think the first thing, and this was some sort of a scandal back then, was it when the wife of Ted, uh, the, of Ned died, Maud? Yeah. I think this was the first time when something happened or, which had consequences in the show, and this was, like, super huge back then. No, but th that's true. It has changed. Like, and if, if you look back, like, what um, in, in the past, were there any movies which got stuck to your head from the past instead? Well, I can start naming some of my favorite movies. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, I just realized something. This is a, a odd thing to bring up two hours in. We're, we're not quite two hours, but um, I actually have. Never mind. No, never mind. It's not a problem. What? I was thinking about I was thinking about something about the stream technically and then I was like, wait, no, it's not actually a problem. Okay, movies. Um, <laughs> so there are definitely movies that were influential and formative on me when I was younger and I couldn't quite say if they're the same today in, in part because I haven't watched some of these in a long time. Um, but my favorite movie when I was like in high school um, is a movie called The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension, which uh, I think it came out in 1984. So 1984 was a really good year for movies. Um, and if you watch it, you might just think it's a goofy, dumb comedy. Uh, but sometimes there's just something about a movie that I don't know, that really grabs you and works for you. And that that movie, yeah, I don't know. It was in some way deeply inspirational that's hard to explain. Um, also, there's a movie Excalibur uh, starring various people. Uh, Patrick Stewart and Helen Mirren are both in it, <laughs> um, if you want famous actors. Um, there's a, several others. Um, it's a, you know, that's a King Arthur, you know, uh, what do you call it? So it's, it's a movie about King Arthur, but a little bit more fictionalized than, than well, no, less fictional. I don't know. It's based on, it's, uh, never mind. Let's, let's not dig the hole. You can watch the movie if you want to know. I'm just, I, I said, you know, it's a little bit less or more fictionalized, and then I started thinking about some of the more modern King Arthur movies, which are crazy. So never mind. I mean, it's fiction to begin with, so whatever. I don't know what I'm trying to say there. Um, uh, that was um, a very influential movie for me in some ways. Um, my favorite movie at some point became Mulholland Drive by David Lynch, mm. um, which again, I'm not sure if other people would get the same things out of that movie that I got, but maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I could I could keep going, but that's probably enough. And this is this 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 is wonderful. Um, Do we want to end at two hours? Like, is that a good? Should we should we start? This is really up to you. I mean, I could probably go a little bit past that. I'm just not sure. At some point, the quality of my answers may start going down because it's just been a long time. We'll see. Really, really up to you how you feel okay. about it. Um, well, we can certainly keep going now. We've, we, okay. We're still only at one hour and 50 minutes, so. Okay, let's aim for um, two hours then. Okay. And then we'll see how you're doing. Sure. Um, yeah. So um, something which I also find find 
really interesting. Um, if you think about your your past couple of years, I mean, is there anything what you would do differently? Or let let me rephrase this question. Um, what would you give yourself as an advice um, to to the younger Jonathan, like five years from now, um, before now, or maybe to to the really young Jonathan? Hmm. I don't know. This is weird because it's probably not very hard to change who you ended up being. And then like, I, I had a pretty hard time in some ways when I was young. Um, so it's tempting to go, to go help that little kid out with some things, but that's why I am who I am today. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, So you have to appreciate it and respect it because <laughs> otherwise you wouldn't be you, right? So um, if, I, if I focus that question a little bit more and make it be about video games and stuff, um, mm -hmm. I definitely could have helped myself with when I started my first game company about just how to do better at everything, how to work with people better, how to program better, mm -hmm. how to make a game that people are going to want to pay attention to, um, how to make a game that's good, both design and art wise, like all those things I could have helped myself with um, because it really, we really knew nothing when we were starting out. Um, you know, as we said before, you always could make things go faster. Um, mm -hmm. There was definitely a time, so my first game company like failed and then I went off and did a bunch of random consulting and stuff. And um, that was kind of like a lot of that I sort of see as wasted time now, like between 2001 and 2004. Like I maybe could have, could have gotten where I am like three or four years faster by not doing all that, but Again, maybe that was a little bit necessary. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Why do you ask these hard questions? I'm going to ask you a very a, a few very fast questions now. Okay. Um, they're called like I, I don't know if you heard of them, but like from from Cruise, the author. So he he had the set of questions. Okay. I'm just I'm just going to ask a few questions and and you can just give quick answers to that what's what's in your mind it's it's sometimes weird questions but let's see where this is going okay what is your idea of perfect happiness easy is questions it, right yeah well <laughs> i definitely have i've i've had experiences of happiness that mm -hmm. you just have and that's not tied to any circumstance in fact, I've had, I've had moments of great happiness while in a situation that, uh, where I was having a hard time, you know, both emotionally and, and physically even. Um, and somehow these things bubble up. And when you experience them, you know what that looks like. And it's just, I almost don't know what to say about it, but but I, kn I know what perfect happiness is like, and it's not, it's not tied to a prerequisite. It's not mm -hmm. tied to me living in a house in the country and sitting on the porch drinking iced tea. Like that's not, that's not it. <laughs> this sounds very American. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. Uh. What is your greatest fear? So I don't know, like intellect, okay, there's two categories of fears, right? There's intellectual fear, like what, what you think you're afraid of, and then how you actually respond in a situation, right? And so for example, uh, I went skydiving one time and my brain totally wanted to go skydiving. <laughs> I thought it was going to be cool. But as we were up there in the plane and they opened the door, like my body and my, you know, my 
emotional systems were like freaking out that I was about to go. I was like really scared, like as scared as I've been of anything in my life. Um, because parts of you don't understand what, what your reasoning part of your brain understands that it's probably fine. Right. Parts of you are like, no, I'm like on a really, really, this airplane is like a really high cliff or something. Cause I'm looking down and just seeing a really long fall hmm. and what's going, I shouldn't be here. What's going on. Right. And so uh, with a lot of things right now, I don't have intellectual fear anymore, but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't have physical fear. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, like let's, you know, one thing a lot of people are afraid of is like dying, right? I'm not afraid of dying mentally. Um, you know, like if I, if I died after we stopped the stream, like if a plane crashes into my house, um, I'll, it's like, well, it's a shame because I wanted to finish some of these games and release them and they would be good. But like, um, it's okay, right? However, <laughs> if I look out the window and I see a plane coming toward my window and it's gonna hit in 10 seconds, um, I'm gonna be afraid physically and try to react and deal with that, right? And, and this is just part of being a human being, I think, or at least, for at my level of development, right? That, that is just what, how it would be. Um, yeah, I think this is pretty much part of your brain. I mean, they, they made studies um, of free solo climbers. Those are the ones who are climbing without any security things, security yeah. stuff. And they found that just specific parts of their brain, which are responsible for fear, are not hmm, working the same way our brains usually do. <laughs> yeah. So I think this is really, really natural. Yeah. yeah. No, no. Okay. And um, which living person do you most admire or who would you like to meet? Do you have any living person? Yourself? Living person, yes. Donald Trump. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is a joke answer. Um, living person who I would like to meet. I don't actually know. Here's the thing. This is a weird question for me. Um, there are definitely people who are doing stuff that I respect, but that doesn't necessarily mean I want to meet them in part because I know people are busy. And unless I think I have something that I could actually give people in the exchange, I'm not sure why I need to meet them. So for example, we were talking about the space launch, right? So I think Elon Musk is doing a lot of good things. Um, you know, he's, he's quirky and he upsets people sometimes and he promises things sometimes and then takes longer to do them than he promised, but usually they get done, which is amazing considering the stuff that, that he's had going on, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that I, want to meet him because what, in fact, <laughs> I actually had the opportunity to meet Elon Musk at, um, so it was a while ago, but there was, um, when they first opened the Tesla factory in Fremont, um, because I owned a Tesla early, I got an invitation to this party and, you know, they did a presentation and p some people went up there and like shook his hand and stuff. And I was like, I just didn't, I was like, why, you know, what, Eh, just let that, he's got enough people who want to talk to him, right? And so um, that's kind of how I feel about it generally. Like, I don't know. I don't know what I would say there. And so that's probably true about most of the people who I think are doing useful things in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, what is an unusual habit or an absurd thing that you really like? Unusual habit <laughs> or absurd thing that I really like. I, 
I mean, what, is, what qualifies as absurd? Like what, where are the boundaries? I don't know. Um, I mean, the, the kind of dancing that I do is really, really weird. <laughs> let's, let's do that one. Um, okay. So it's, it's called contact improvisation. And mm -hmm. if people do it and they're not very skilled at it, it looks terrible. Um, it looks like clumsy people uh, like falling down <laughs> and, and like doing really uncouth things. Um, but when people are good at it, it looks kind of nice. <laughs> Still not as good as most other kinds of dancing though, because um, it is not about how it looks, right? Unlike most other forms of dancing, it deprioritizes to the extreme how things look and it's about how things feel when you do them. Or that's not even right, but um, it's about how it's about how things unfold improvisationally when you're in a certain situation. And so um, if you get preoccupied about how things look, then it prevents you from exploring various lines of stuff. And so that is probably the weirdest thing that I do with regularity. Although again, since virus time, it hasn't yeah. been, it's been a while. Um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely the strangest thing that I do regularly. Hmm. Maybe two more questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, in the, in the last years, maybe five years, what new mm, method, belief, behavior, tool, or habit has most improved your life? In five years? Just as a number. I don't know. So this is weird, right? One danger that we have is that we get old enough and then we just get rooted in our ways and don't do anything new. And I try not to do that, but, um, well, okay. I don't know if this falls into that category, but, and it's actually, it's a little bit more than five years ago, but we'll, we'll call it five years. Mm -hmm. Um, so toward the end of the development cycle of the witness, I was going into the office every day and I was not happy, right? Because it's just when projects go really long, you get tired of them or not, not exactly tired of them because I wanted to be working on it. It was the thing I most wanted to do, but like you're just carrying a heavy weight for a long time and you're like, oh my God, when is this going to end? And, you know, even if you bring meditation to bear and stuff, which I had, I had some training in that by that point, you know, if you're not perfect, which most people aren't, it still wears on you. And, um, and part of it was just the, the engine that we had put together made, you know, as you get a game closer to done, there are more graphical assets, right? And they get bigger and bigger and it takes longer to do things like load them or process them if you need to do some automated processing on them or, you know, recompute the lighting for the world. And it gets to a point where it becomes very sluggish to just try to get new things done. And that was a real drag. And it's especially a drag when there's so many things to do and you feel like you can't do them very fast because of like the computer, right? And part of that was programming in this programming language C++ that most engine programmers use to build things with. And I just had this very fatalistic attitude toward it, like, well, we can't do anything about that. So I just have to like deal with this and get the game done. And then at some point I just changed that. I was like, wait, is that really true? I know that that's what everybody thinks, but is that really true? And I was like, yeah, no, it's not true. Like I shouldn't, like we should finish this game in C++, but I don't have to accept that this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life, right? I can actually change this and do a different thing. And that's what led me to work on this new programming language. But as soon as I decided to do it, as soon as I said, this is actually not an unfixable problem, we can do something about this, um, I became much happier immediately because I was no longer like in jail. I was no longer in C++ jail for the rest of my that's, life. That's great, yeah. And 
Um, so I try to use that as an example for other things as well. Whenever, mm -hmm. like I, I know that feeling now, I know smaller versions of it. Like when it comes to the way a game is designed, like, oh, I realize I'm having this, I'm in jail feeling like I don't like this part of this game's design, but I've assumed that it just has to be the case, right? And I just go back and look like, does it really have to be the case? Well, I mean, I decided that because this, but we could make that decision differently if we're willing to pay the cost of making the decision differently. Um, is that cost worth me being happier with the game because it's a better game? Well, yes, right? And so once you learn to revisit those decisions, um, it becomes a very good thing to do. And so that, that C++ instance, I think was the biggest one, but mm. I've learned to do that more often from that example. Oh, this, this, this is fantastic. Okay, so ready for the last question? Okay. <laughs> okay, very, very small and easy one. No. Um, what advice would you give? Um, so I'm speak. I would speak from a like very smart college student, but it could be like anyone in general, uh, yeah. developer, any developer, yeah. whatever. So what advice would you give a student about to enter the sort of real world? Yeah, and especially. What advice should they ignore? And yeah. and may, maybe also okay. part of this, what are really bad ex recommendations you often hear in, in this profession? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, this very, is very, very easy, quick one. <laughs> this is actually a rant that I've given before. So we'll see if we can mix it up a little bit this time. But um, The very short version of the advice is that being good at what you do actually really matters a lot. And that is the primary thing that you should be working on is how to be good at what you do, how to be good at learning, right? How to be, how to, how to be good at getting better at things. It's like a second order skill. Um, now, People used to know this, um, and we sort of lost it generationally. I think starting with my generation, right? I'm part of Generation X, which the stereotype when we were growing up was like we were slackers who don't work hard um, or whatever. Um, a little bit differently, like the millennial stereotype was like a little different from that. But um, anyway. Some of us, though, still found how to how to work hard and and be good at things, right? But but a lot of my generation sort of didn't really. Um, and then I think that's gotten worse with each successive generation because, in part, at least in America, and I think in some of Europe, I think Europe is not as bad at this as as America, though. Um, we have all this rhetoric that attaches values to other things that are in competition with being good. Like, um, like everybody should feel good all the time. Or like society should be fair and shouldn't promote uh, winners over losers. And so we should be fair by denying that there's a skill factor here that could separate people who are better and people who are worse, right? Or we just won't won't talk about that, right? Um, just anybody, you know, in games, this takes the form that getting into indie games is about community and feeling like part of the community. And it's like, yes, that's one dimension of it. That is one thing that you can get. But it's also <laughs> a very, it's very difficult to make games especially to make them good. And um, I think what happens in the US, it's one of the reasons why I kind of checked out of the indie game scene that happens around GDC in the US is because it felt to me like it's mostly about people wanting to feel good that they're in a community, which, you know, I understand that. I grew up a computer nerd who felt left out of everything. And so, I understand the idea of being around friends who understand you and are into the things that you're into. However, 
You don't want that to happen. Like it's fine if that happens, but you don't want it to happen at the expense of actually doing a good job and, and being good at the discipline of making games, right? Um, and this weird thing happened where when you say that, like I've been yelled at for saying this, well, yelled at virtually on the internet many times, right? And called like an elitist or something, but it's not, it's not elitism because anybody can get good at something, right? You just work hard and you pay attention to what you're not doing well and you improve, right? That is, that is a totally fair playing field. Um, it's not exclusionary. It's not, they have all these terms that they try to throw at you, like gatekeeping and whatever the hell the kids say these days, right? Um, it's not that. Um, it is just the acknowledgement that this is a discipline that can be very difficult. And the sooner you get good at it, the easier a time that you will have, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you spend a lot of time not being good, then you'll just feel like people talk about this imposter syndrome thing. Um, If you get into video games, you should feel like you're not good at it because you're probably not. It would have to be some kind of a miracle for you to start in video games and like actually be good because there's so many dimensions of skill to, to get to some bare level of competence before you can produce things well. So you should feel like you're not good. Um, but that's different from imposter syndrome. Like imposter syndrome is when you feel like you're not good but you're pretending to be just as good as anyone else. Stop the pretending part. Say, no, I'm actually not good yet, but that's fixable, right? I see this thing I can work on. I see this thing I can work on. I see this thing I can work on. If you have that mindset, you'll get good actually very fast. And so the other thing to say is that the years when you first get out of school um, and you're still pretty young are very valuable years because you're not that tied down in life. You have a lot of youthful energy, right? Um, you could do all-nighters just because you want to as many times a week as you want. Um, and so that time is very valuable. And if you spend that time, like if you go work for a boring company that's not doing anything very interesting and you won't learn very fast, um, then you're spending this valuable time inefficiently. Whereas with my first company, I mentioned already that it failed and we went out of business. I think I said that, but it did. The, the first game company that I mentioned where we started and didn't really know what we were doing. Um, even though it failed, it was a very good experience because I was working. It's like cycling a, an engine as fast as it can go. I was working really hard every day thinking about things that were beyond my understanding, you know, both design wise, programming wise, um, and just really, um, you know, trying really hard to make this game back when it was really hard to do that, to, to make anything at all. And um, that was very good for learning. And the best thing you can do, no matter what age you are, the best thing you can do is to put yourself in that situation. Uh, but if you do it, the sooner you do it, the better. So if you're young and you're out of school or about to be out of school, it's a very prime opportunity. And you want to use that time as best as you can. That's all. Um, and then there was a part of the question that was about, okay, uh, so there's this, there's this thing that many people have heard of called Sturgeon's Law, right? That 80% of everything is really not very good. Um, maybe 90% sometimes people say, and it's generally true. And that's true about everything um, normally. So like if people work at a certain job, most of the people who do that job are not particularly good, right? A small percentage of them, well, I, I, a decent fraction of them will be pretty good and a small percentage of them will be like excellent, right? Who do you learn from? Who should you take advice from? Well, if you actually care, if you want to be good, you should take advice from the people who are excellent. How do you know who's excellent? Well, that's actually the hard part because you don't know yet. If you're just learning, you don't know how to judge what's good or not because that's what you're trying to learn. You're trying to learn what's good, right? And so... Um, you're in a very weird position. 
in the start. And one thing I can say about that is it just, it really matters who you choose to learn from, choose carefully. Mm. Because again, if you, if you learn from somebody who's not that good or teaching you things that are wrong, which I'm sad to say happens a lot at universities in the US, for example, that teach game design, um, you know, you're, you're actually, you're not just wasting the time, but you're learning things that are actually bad that you have to unlearn later. And so then, then you waste even more time later. Mm. Um, so that's important, but also it, it just makes it very hard because even if the internet were a neutral, the internet is biased in a certain way that I'll mention in a minute, but even if the internet was a, just a totally neutral conduit for information, then 80% of the advice that you could find about how to do something would not be good, right? It would just be that average mediocre advice that wouldn't get you very good results. Um, and if you did a web search, like how do I program this thing or how do I design that thing, you would get mostly results that are not good. Now, the problem on the internet is it's actually worse than that because by volume, the people typing things into the internet are the people who are not spending that time working hard on a project and getting good at it and learning, right? Like the, the, the less time people have to do that stuff or the less time people spend doing that stuff, the more time they spend goofing off on the internet, right? So by volume, the internet is mostly populated by material from people who don't have high standards over what they do with their time. By definition, that is, that is the technological thing that we have built. And you can tell that just by reading Twitter any time of the day, just like read, you know, <laughs> hopefully you judiciously filter your Twitter feed so that you only follow people who say interesting things. But if you go click on some like random trending Twitter thing that's not filtered and you go read what people have to say, it's not very good. And that's just, that's just the thing that we have designed for some reason as a society. So maybe we can improve that at some point, but in the meantime, you just need to be aware of that and you need to know just because you read some advice that appears to give you an explanation of what to do and what makes sense doesn't mean it's good, you know? And then I would double down on that and even say, it's not just the internet, but like, like I said a while ago, I think we've had some institutional decline in Western civilization where, for example, the things that universities teach are maybe um, not the right things anymore. Uh, you know, I know, I know I'm treading on hot coals talking about this uh, <laughs> with you, but you know, um, universities have a very hard problem because as technology has advanced, um, the complexity of what there is to learn has exploded, right? And yeah. the number of things there are to learn has exploded. Um, nevertheless, I think many of them have not done a good job dealing with that problem and do not have sufficient... Um, standards of quality over what they teach. And they teach things that are, um, you know, like, like if, if we talk about software engineering, like how should you write a program, right? One of the things that was taught very heavily was object-oriented programming, which by itself was an appropriated term. Like Alan Kay invented the term object-oriented programming and it meant something totally different than what universities ended up teaching, right? Um, which I'm not. I'm also not saying you should program in the Alan K way because I don't like that either. But um, this object-oriented thing got taught, and it does solve certain problems, but it creates a lot of problems, and it also creates a lot of fake knowledge where you feel like you're learning something or doing something, but you're really just doing busy work. And um, so I come from a relatively contrarian viewpoint that took me a while to build up, where I say, you know, this object-oriented stuff really almost none of it is actually good. I see why you thought it was good, but it's really not. And so when I designed this programming language, it's it's not object oriented at all, right? It's the year 2020 and I'm trying to move us away from that. Um, so even things like universities, like they definitely have good knowledge. Like, I, you know, I went to Berkeley for computer science. I learned some things that were good that I wouldn't have learned if I was just at home hacking on my personal computer or whatever. Um, but what percentage of what I was taught was actually right? 
I mean, it might be around 50%, <laughs> honestly. Um, it's a valuable 50%, but you have to like learn how to separate the good 50% from the bad 50%, and it's not that easy. Um, I feel like this is turning into a really long rambling answer, um, but hopefully, hopefully that's good. Did I miss part of the I, question? It's it's perfect. Actually, it's <laughs> okay. perfect. I, I I just really need to give my five coins on that um, because I agree on on so many things here. Um, um, but what I think or what so what my way of teaching is so I or what I took away from the university I never thought of the university of a place where I get the knowledge of specific subject but what I got out of, of the university I learned how to think and I learned how to learn and this is also the way how I want to teach so I want to teach in a way that people understand how to find material themselves how to think critical how to um i don't know build up knowledge because i'm i'm definitely not capable of of knowing everything and answering all the questions that's yeah. why i'm also so so excited that that you are here today and 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 giving us this this extra knowledge and then talking to us about that but um, different things because this is certainly one of the issues let's put it that way um, because obviously many experts in the industry are in the industry and mm -hmm. and and i think it, it's nice that there's sometimes some communication happening and yeah yeah i mean i think like i think definitely i did just get done saying that most of the internet is like low effort stuff but I think it's good when when we get people who have a lot of experience to show up and and uh, you know put put some effort in and actually try to explain things because it is um, like a lot of being good at video games is just kind of understanding context like this very complicated context of just what it is like to make video games. And that's changing all the time, year after year. So like a university couldn't even really establish a curriculum in this because by the time they did, it would be kind of different. Um, maybe it'll settle down eventually. Now, of course, the learning how to learn thing, I agree that's important. Um, it's, it's hard though, right? Like, so first of all, if you wanna be a critical thinker and learn how to learn, you shouldn't just believe what I'm saying, all you people out there, right? You, sh you should take it into account as one viewpoint and then try to look at that with other viewpoints, but then apply some mechanism of discernment that'll help you tell what to listen to and what not to. And how do you do that? That's, that's complicated, right? I will say, you know, I went to Berkeley, which is one of the better computer science schools, right? I mean, I would put it, I don't know how it looks like from Europe, but I, I would put it as top, one of the top four in the US for computer science, at least at that time. Probably this ranking hasn't changed, but like mm -hmm. the top four Thank schools you. are roughly, they're like Stanford, MIT, uh, Carnegie Mellon, and Berkeley probably. Mm -hmm. um, nope, Berkeley is really renowned for computer science. Yeah, pe people could argue with that. That's not in order or anything, but like when I think of those schools, it's hard for me to think of a number five that I would even put in that same group. Um, but you know, I don't know, these things change all the time. So maybe some of those schools are better or worse than they used to be, or maybe there's a fifth or sixth one, whatever. It's just when I was going to school, that was what everybody understood to be the good schools, right? But then when I think back at the stuff that I was taught, it was a lot like, it was like a technical version of political arguments that you might have today, right? Where <laughs> p political arguments in the year 2020 are just like, you say the reasons why people should listen to your thing, but you don't, you don't critically assess your own position, right? And you don't try to point out the weaknesses in your own position. So, you know, one of the first things that I was taught when I went to Berkeley was, hey, um, Actually, this was a course load that also came from MIT, like MIT started it, I think, um, where we use the Abelson and Sussman Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programming book that like teaches you the scheme programming language, which is actually, like scheme is really bad in some basic ways. It's not a good first language to teach people, okay? Um, yeah. 
But that that was the first language. Um, there are some good things about it. It's simple in certain good ways, right? But this also came with a certain amount of indoctrination. Like functional programming languages are really good. Um, yeah. You know, statically compiled languages are bad. Read eval print loops are good. And these would be explained to me and the reasons behind this would be given, right? Um, and that's like, that's, it, it was a lot like indoctrination, right? And then of course, later classes in the university were taught by people who, who use different ways of programming, right? But as you know, I'm sure, um, the way that universities work is that professors never outright contradict each other because um, that just makes a huge mess as soon as that starts to happen. There's something, um, or I don't know, I mean, again, maybe it's different in Europe, but like at a university in the US, um, you don't do that. What You instead maybe offer your own thing and then the students just have to decide, right? And so what kind of happens is whoever, whoever says the most things that are opinionated gets heard the most by the students and the professors who are more just like, just trying to do serious work and discover, discover more computer science or, or make better engineering or whatever, um, those lessons don't really get taught because they're not, they're not talking at you about how to program. So I don't know, like it took me a long time to synthesize the things that I was taught into something that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, it probably took at least 10 years, right? To like really figure out what was not good about what I was taught and then what was actually good. And that was at one of the supposedly better computer schools in the US. So yeah. uh, who knows elsewhere? Yeah, but l let me just tell you like my story from my perspective. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so so I, I started or we, we first got taught C, then assembly, then C++, and then Java, and then C, C sharp never, I think this was just assumed that we know, know that stuff. And it was always like, okay, no, so C, C is the best thing because of, okay. And so it was a very opinionate yeah. um, argument that we were having. And this was like the first class we were having. And then after, and then assembly, no, but assembly can be used, so useful because of. So yeah. also, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's so much better. And then C++, this makes so many things so much faster and easier. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's also true. And obviously, as a student, um, that's what you learn and that's what you start to believe. And then you all of a sudden you realize, oh, wow, there are different ways of looking at that. And there are different ways how you can, um, okay, this professor tells you or, or this doesn't need to be a professor, can also be a booker because someone with, with, with strong opinion tells you that and, and the other person is telling you something different. So maybe, maybe you start eventually thinking by yourself, oh, okay, so maybe there are different viewpoints about that and I should start thinking and doing some research myself in order to find the best choice for my specific problem. Yeah. So and this is this is what I mean by that I definitely learned this this sort of thinking and researching and and teaching myself or learning for myself um, through exactly seeing this sort of different opinions here. Yeah, I think that that's good. But it, it, at least for me, um, I had to do that opinion sorting myself, right? Like, yeah. like the the person who was teaching Scheme never said. Yeah, it's really inconvenient to not have static checking like you do in Pascal. So you make all these errors that you have to find at runtime. Like my memories of trying to program in Scheme are just like almost completely trying to debug programs where something dumb was wrong that took hours to figure out. You know, I mean, we were using little VT100 terminals half the time. Like it was, it was the old days in some ways. Um, but you know, like. I would, I would more respect a viewpoint that said, well, this language doesn't have that, but it has this other property and it's worth that trade-off, right? And um, usually the arguments were not of that form or if they were, uh, they didn't really, it wasn't 
a real case. It was the kind of fake case that people make when they want you to believe their thing. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, but you do, you, you can, you can learn what you're talking about. Um, it's just, I wish that that were, I think computer science in general needs to be less sure about the conclusions it has come to and less confident about what it teaches students. Um, it, you know, so there's, there's a part of computer science that's indisputable, right? The part that's more like math. I mean, I guess it's maybe mildly disputable in some cases, but you know, so the things like, um, you know, here's, you, you can measure how long it takes a program to do something, right? How many operations and you can categorize it as like n log n or n squared and all these things. And n log n is faster, a lot faster than n squared. Like that stuff is, um, It's, it's not really anyone's opinion, right? Um, the parts that are more like engineering are people's opinion. And what I would say about that is that I kind of feel like software hasn't gotten that much better since about 1996, thereabout, since the web got big. Um, and there are probably reasons for that. And the reasons are that the practices that we've all decided are correct or maybe not the right ones. Now that's not all universities' fault, right? Because a lot of these practices are industry <laughs> developed you. practices, right? So there's, I mean, there's all kinds of books you can get written by people in industry about how you should program. And I think most of those are wrong too. Um, but we, we need to be a lot less sure about what we think we know and go back and start over and look at what, look at what we actually have today in terms of how well it operates compared to how well it should theoretically operate and then ask why is there a difference and how do we fix that difference seriously that is what i would like to see yeah yeah i think i think like this is like my 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 perspective on that i think it should be more more and more supported that industry and academia is working closer together with because i think this is definitely part of the solution for for both sides and yeah. Although I'm not sure it should be a by committee thing. Like if you got a big committee of academic people and a big committee of industry people, um, I think, you know, there's this thing that happens when you average a bunch of values. Like say you have a strategy where picking a high value is right and then a different, yeah. and that could succeed and a value where picking a low value is right and that could succeed. And you average everybody's opinion and you get like five instead of one or 10. And five is really bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's very easy to end up with that. And also just the Sturgeon's Law thing. Like if you do a survey of people's opinions in industry about how to program and take that advice, it's going to be bad advice, kind of. I mean, it'll be good in that there are certain kinds of problems we don't have anymore. And that's good. We did solve some problems, but we also made a lot of problems. And we need to notice that. So I am a big fan of smaller groups of people who have a vision of how things could be different or maybe even individuals, whether they're, you know, professors or, you know, individual people in industry or something about them striking forth and doing something to show how it could be different than what we could do today. Right. Various mm-hmm. people have done that. Um, You know, it's one of the things I'm trying to do with the new programming language. Um, But I think we need a lot more of that. We need people to say, look, it doesn't have to be the way this is. It could be this other way. Let Um, me actually, because computer science and software engineering are both about like actually making things. Maybe computer science isn't about making, I don't know. But I can actually make a thing that actually shows you that kind of proves my idea or not. The problem is, when looking at those standards of proof, we also have to have have high standards of what we accept because we, for many decades, just said like, oh, cool, it's a running program that implements a thing. So all the person's claims about the program must be correct. And that doesn't, that's not really true, you know. I feel like I'm not giving very good answers anymore. So. No, 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 it's, it's um, perfect. This yeah. last question just escalated. Um, I'm <laughs> But, but let me um, let me 
really summarize, especially like um, the, this last uh, minutes and what you said okay. before um, about the um, the advices for students or people trying to learn. This is very inspirational, and um, again, it's always also very inspirational for me talking to you. And I think I think there are so many things which you said, which reflected also to many people in the chat and will hopefully also help, um, yeah, help people finding their better paths, either in this industry or, or somewhere else. And, yeah, yeah. I, I hope so. I mean, I don't know what proportion of people in chat plan to actually go into games versus more general I don't know who's there, but I mean, games is very rewarding in a certain way. That's why I'm there, right? It is yeah. though, like I said, it's also very difficult. Um, it's a good time in some ways right now because it's it's easier to make a game than it has ever been almost in history. So, you know, like there are these engines that you could just turn on and make them do some things. And in a weekend you could have a game that doesn't look too bad where your character runs around and does stuff. Uh, the thing is, there's also, there are disadvantages to doing that as well. And um, once you start trying to solve those problems, it becomes difficult again, right? And so it's a challenging field. Um, that's good. The fact that it's challenging means that you can show up in the field and do something that other people can't do, right? Because if it was easy, then everybody would just be doing fine. And what, what can you do? Nothing, right? So um, the fact that it's challenging is good. It means you can do something really major and interesting. You can drive the field forward. You could build something that really impresses people, or you could just have fun making interesting things. And so um, that's why I'm here, but also don't underestimate what you're getting into because it's, I mean, in a four year university, you can only learn a small amount. It's just not enough time. Um, you can only learn a small amount of what you really need to know. Um, like when I started working on Braid was probably when I started doing well enough at games to really start making things that were actually interesting by my current standards today, right? Um, stuff before that was all, you know, not that great in one way or another, although some of it was fixable. I just didn't know how at the time. Um, but the point being, I had been programming and doing just little, you know, amateur game design at home, not not very sophisticated, uh, since I was 10 years old. And it took me till I was 32 to get to that point. It was a long time. Now, mm -hmm. fortunately, Younger people today, a lot more has been figured out for them in advance. So you could probably do it a lot faster. You could get, you can cover as much ground as I did a lot faster than I did because you have a head start, um, but still it's not easy. And you should understand that going in. That's all. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. And yeah, I think there are so many takeaways from there. Thanks for having so much time for us and can right. we have a big round of virtual applause in the chat for Jonathan, please? Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thanks for sitting there. Those of you who have been here two hours and a half, uh, thanks for sitting all that time. <laughs> or maybe Thank standing you. or treadmill desking or whatever. Treadmill and, desking. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can always, um, you know, for people who don't know, um, I stream programming once in a while. I might later today after a lunch break. So if you want to see what kind of stuff I do, you could go to my Twitch channel. Sometimes we just play games, but you know, more often than not, it's we really, program. It's an eight to eight, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, Twitch, tw Twitch is a really interesting thing because it's different even, like YouTube is interesting because you can learn stuff in a, in a different way than written material. But in Twitch, it's live and not edited and not prepared. And that just makes it really different. You see like a little closer to how it really is when somebody sits down and programs. Mm -hmm. The problem is that not very many experienced programmers do that. I think in part because their job won't let them and in part because nobody wants you to see them make mistakes. But I don't care if you see me make mistakes, so <laughs> it's all good. 
All right. Thank you for doing then, the interview as well. It's been good talking to you. This was this was fun. Yeah. Yeah. This was absolutely fun. I mean, I would I would have probably 30 to 40 more questions, but I'm sure. <laughs> we can do another one yeah. in a few months if you want. Um, I don't know. Perfect. My voice just gets tired after a little bit. So this would, this this would, would, enough be, for now. This would be fantastic. All right. Um, have, a, have a great rest of the day. Have a great weekend. I hope you can do fun stuff at the weekend. Get a little I'm in California. Stuff. We can't do anything. <laughs> You can go hiking. You can go to the to the seaside. It's okay. you have to see. It's pretty there. <laughs> the, the beach might be closed. I'm not sure. Really? Yeah, I'm not sure. Anyway, no. thank you, everybody. So, bye, bye. Bye. Bye, bye. bye everyone. <laughs> bye.